Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. Now, I've raised questions about that in the past. Deuteronomy was written more than 3,000 years ago, and you call that present truth? Well, it has some pretty good ideas in it. This is less. If it's truth, isn't it always truth? Yeah, that should be true. Yes. It's not your truth and somebody else's truth, it's truth. Yes. Lesson seven we're studying today for November 13 of 2021, entitled Law and Grace. Hmm, that's a fairly current topic, isn't it? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your inspired record for all that it means to us and all that it can teach us. Help us to know how we can prepare in a world that's rapidly deteriorating and things are becoming worse and worse and people are dying and storms are destroying and epidemics are killing. Lord, help us to realize that these are just the warning signs of what's coming. May we be prepared as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How do you understand these verses, the following passages? These should be fairly familiar to most of us. Jim? 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. That's from the New American Standard Bible of 1995. Galatians 3:22. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin. And so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who believe. American Bible Society, again, in 1992. Ephesians verse two, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. Good news, Bible. Romans 3, 23, everyone has sinned and is far from the God's glory, excuse me, from God's saving presence, the Good News Bible. Romans 6, 23, for sin pays its wage, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord, also from the Good News Bible. So now, if you believe what we have just read, you would understand, it's very clear, that apart from God's grace, we all should die. We're all sinners. Sinners are supposed to die. Sin pays its wage, death. Well, most Christians eh, grudgingly admit that that's true. They're not happy about it, but well, they shouldn't be. Um, Seventh-day Adventists, of course, will rush to talk about the Seventh-day Sabbath because that's one of the things that we believe we observe, or we believe, we keep, and other Christians do not. But um, what about the main discussion for this week? It's not about whether or not we should keep the Sabbath. That's something for another time. Well, as we have studied before, love can only occur in the context of freedom. Love or obedience, which follows, that is somehow forced, or love or obedience that is somehow forced, or coerced is not love or obedience at all. Carrie? Readings from Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire from the Good News Bible. Like I have I have some questions about that. You think it's only because of the Bible that uh, people are, 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 are covetous? Yeah, no. I don't think so. I think that comes pretty naturally to most of us. Might the same idea, at least in principle, exist in heaven when more, where moral beings, that is, angels, exist as well? So we're exploring the ideas. Is this a principle that applies to all moral beings, or is it just specific, let's say, for planet Earth or for human beings? In heaven, love is the dominant principle in every action. We read these words about Satan when he chose to rebel. 
Go Ezekiel ahead. 28, 15 to 16 from the Good News Bible. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. You were busy buying and selling. Do they do that in heaven? Well, remember this is talking about the Prince of Tyre. And in, in those biblical times, you talked about something that was local, but it was a symbol of something greater. And it's, the buying and selling was probably what was going on in Tyre. He was they, certainly a trader. He was certainly, yes. Trading, not trading, trator. Yes. Yeah. And this led you to violence and sin. So I forced you to leave my holy mountain, and the angel who guarded you drove you away from the sparkling gems. Our entire universe operates according to strict laws, from the minutest subatomic particles to the largest galaxies. It doesn't matter, the heavens obey laws like the law of gravity. But moral law applies only to those who have the ability to think and choose and thus have freedom. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Very quick. So uh, why do most of Christendom say there is no need for the laws anymore? Well, it's because they're making a mistake. Their yeah. paradigm is Yeah, we, really we're going to see that that's, that's far away from the truth. Well, look at these words from Ellen White. Myra? The will of God is expressed in the precepts of His holy law, and the principles of this law are the principles of heaven. The angels of heaven attain unto no higher knowledge than to know the will of God, and to do His will is the highest service that can engage their powers. Let me interrupt for a second. Um, well, go ahead, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment a little bit later. Okay. You'll interrupt me again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. But in heaven, service is not rendered in a spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah's, Jehovah, the thought that there was a, a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels were not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their Creator. Obedience is no, to them is no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. So in every soul wherein Christ, the, the hope of glory, dwells, his words are re-echoed. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, the law is within my heart. Psalms 40, verse 8. That's a great quote. To go up a little bit further where it says that they were not as angels, they were as, as sons of God. That's yeah. Benny Elohim. Yeah. That, that's well, a, I, Elohim, yeah. yeah. Well, sons you, of God. you would have to say the sons of Elohim. Um, anyway, thoughts from the Mount of Blessing? Yes. Page 109, paragraph 1 and 2, a marvelous quotation, mm -hmm. especially when it talks about uh, the angels haven't attained no higher knowledge. I'm sorry. They, um, when Satan, when Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In other words, they did God's will because they wanted to, because they saw that was the right thing to do. Satan and his followers had to leave heaven because they refused to live in an atmosphere dominated by love. We are studying the book of Deuteronomy. What is the relationship between grace and the law in the book of Deuteronomy? Do we understand that? Many, many verses in Deuteronomy suggest that God, one, delivered them out of the land of Egypt, a feat which they could never have accomplished by themselves, two, took them through the Red Sea on dry land, and then three, spoke to them from Sinai. Nothing like that has ever happened to any other nation at any time in history. But notice the very specific instructions given in Deuteronomy 17, 15 through 19. Charles? Make sure that the man you choose to be king is the one whom the Lord has chosen. He must be one of your own people. Do not make a foreigner your king. The king is not to have a large number of horses for his army. And he is not to send people to Egypt 
to buy horses because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there. The king is not to have many wives because this would make him turn away from the Lord. And he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep the book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. Good news Bible. I got a question. Yes. Sir, tell me one king of Israel or Judah that followed this? Well, I hope it was David. One wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it doesn't say one wife. I mean, Solomon's first... Not many wives. <laughs> not many wives, but the translation. So but. Solomon, Solomon, his first wife was an Egyptian princess. Yeah, and he was the wisest man. And look at all the wives and concubines and so forth he had and the horses he had and so forth. But, but well, see, the principle is that I want him to be a humble man. Yeah. But you don't see it there. Yeah. Well, um, what's important in this passage is this is an example of the reason why some critical scholars say the book of Deuteronomy could not possibly have been written by Moses. It had to be written th a thousand years later in the days of Ezra because nobody could predict this kind of events. And so, I mean, we immediately think, oh yeah, we think of Solomon, we think of David, we think of these people. Nobody could have predicted that. Not even God can predict the future. And so they immediately, they think Deuteronomy was written maybe 400 B.C. or something like that. Not 1400 B.C. like we're sure it was actually written. And in verse 16 it says, the king is not to have many horses, quote, because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there, to Egypt, that is. Yeah. Um, I thought that the reason they weren't supposed to have horses is because they weren't supposed to have offensive weapons. More of the same. Yeah, I think that's also true. I think also, it, doesn't it say, because I don't want them to go back to yeah. Egypt. That's the bottom line. I, well, yeah, and I agree, I agree. Just imagine how different things would have been for Israel and later Judah if they had always followed these directions. Imagine if the king every day had read, even just from the books of Moses. Uh, don't you see, what was his name, Zushaya? He says, get the book of yeah. the books of the law. I mean, yeah. they all lost it. I mean, no yeah. one was reading. It was, it was lost in the trash right. in the in the in the right, right. In, in the temple because nobody was using it. No, just junk it piled up. I have to pick your bread. I have to pick your bread. At the same time, it says, I have called my son out of Egypt. Yeah, yeah. He he calls Egypt. I mean, he calls Israel his son. And of course, Jesus he, came that's out of what Egypt. I'm saying. Yeah. Jesus came out of Egypt. Yeah. He probably swam in the Nile River for all you know, you know. Maybe, I don't know. I don't think they were down in Egypt for a long period of time. I, I hope not. Well, there were some warnings. Uh, we saw, we just read something there. And these warnings are found in Deuteronomy 28. Let me read that for you, starting with verse 58. If you do not obey faithfully all God's teachings that are written in this book, and if you do not honor the wonderful and awesome name of the Lord your God, he will send on you and on your descendants incurable diseases and horrible, horrible epidemics that can never be stopped. He will bring on you once again all the dreadful diseases you experienced in Egypt, and you will never recover. He will also send all kinds of diseases and epidemics that are not mentioned in this book of God's laws and teachings, and you will be destroyed. Although you become as numerous as the stars in the sky, only a few of you will survive because you did, know, did not obey the Lord your God. 
Just as the Lord took delight in making you prosper and in making you increase in number, so he will take delight in destroying you and in bringing ruin on you. You will be uprooted, uprooted from the land that you're about to occupy. That's Deuteronomy 32, 45, well, also compared to Deuteronomy 32, 45, and 46. My, my turn to interrupt. 30, yes. <laughs> Careful. Please do. Careful. Uh. Yeah. I, I mean, why does it sound so arbitrary? Okay. There's if a you don't yeah, obey, I, I will yeah. kill you. Well, it doesn't quite say that, but almost. No, I yeah. will send plagues and Rather epidemics. Rather than, and, you know, the picture we have, now, I, I do understand that we're looking at it from our point in history yeah. and where this is coming from, but I think there are many that read this and just go, I mean, he's going to send diseases and epidemics. We're going through a pandemic. Okay, well, that's the subject of our next paragraph. Can we look at that? Yes, okay. Why do blessings come on those who obey God? Why do curses come on those who do not? Is it because God is actively blessing some and cursing others? Or could it be that doing what God commands is the right thing to do, and therefore it brings blessings? Could it be that disobeying God is not doing what is best, so it leads to curses and losses? In trying to explain what happened at that serious, even disastrous General Conference session in 1888, see the preceding paragraphs in this letter, if you want to follow it up a little bit more, uh, you can. Ellen White explained the issue very clearly in writing. She was talking about the law in Galatians specifically, but look at what this says about all kinds of law. Jim? The law of Ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness and obedi obedience. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Why is that? Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness in obedience. Is that because obedience leads to good results? Or is it because God says, ah, I caught you obeying, there's a blessing? Go ahead. As received in Christ, it works to, in us the purity of character that will bring joy to us through eternal ages. To the obedient, it is a wall of protection. We behold in, in it, excuse me, we behold in it the goodness of God who by revealing to men the immutable principles of righteousness seeks to shield them from the evils that result from transgression. We are so not, there it says the evils come from what? From God's curses or do they come from sinning? Evils from transgression. Okay. Does not that all mean the times. A, does that mean a natural result of transgression? A consequence? Sounds like results. A consequence, as Jim yeah. says. Charles? Lord, the Lord allows bad things to happen to very good people. Oh, well, what you about the Apostle that. Paul? Come what? on, yes. John the Baptist. Yeah. Job. Peter. Right, right. Jesus. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. He allows bad things, horrible things happen to but some there of are the reasons. diseases. Yeah, but yeah there are, okay, that's, but those things happen because of the evil of the people who perpetrated those things, not because of the evil done by the yeah, ones, the ones sure, who suffered. For sure. Okay, go ahead. We are not to regard God, regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. How many do that? <laughs> a lot. Most of us. Well, of you. if you read that other paragraph that we just read. From Deuteronomy. With, from, yeah, from Deuteronomy. And don't have a full understanding. Yep. I mean, it's easy to jump to that, you know, people, and Gordon and I were discussing this on the way here tonight. How do we keep from, or how do we not rationalize a text, a whatever, in, in our understanding here? to fit what we think it should be. How do we know we're ra not rationalizing? How do we know we're actually reading the Bible the way it should be? Yeah. yeah. Instead of, this is uh, my picture, I want to make yeah. it fit, Because you can curve make, it to make it fit that way. You can way. make anything fit what you... There's enough information in the Bible that you, by a little twisting here and there, you, yeah. can, you can support. But, I would, I would say that if, if a person is willing to read the whole of it and get the overall picture, then you should be safe. So, anyway, go I'm ahead. Just, 
I would use an example of in Jeremiah. It says, if you guys don't clean up your act, uh, and, and the way it's generally t translated is, I'm going to bring the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. It could be just as well le legitimately. Many times, if you have a, your phone and you look at an interlinear, you've got as many as eight w words in English came from one Hebrew word. And then you find out that one Hebrew word may be uh, have maybe as many as 75 ways to translate that thing. As as, as, as example of many English words are the same way. Yeah, okay. So another way you could have translate that business, if you guys don't clean up your act, excuse me, the Babylonians are coming if you don't click it, but it isn't that I'm God's going to yeah. bring them. It's just uh, in God's foreknowledge, he knows what's going to happen. Yeah. You don't... As but, a, but in, in the case of Deuteronomy, we know that Moses' and the, the attitude of the people at that point in time is anything that's beyond our human natural explanation of how it happened, it's because God did it. That's, that was, their, that's their paradigm. That was their paradigm, and we need to take that into account when we look at that. And, and, and uh, if we take the, the text, excuse me, the Gospels, Jesus never advocated any killing. But yet it says that he came to, to show what the Father was like, John 14, 9. And I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. I've made known your character, John 17, 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he, he had a golden opportunity to explain, now this is the way you're going to do the killing of those that, that have made me angry. Yeah, no. It's, that's not there. There's so many things he could have explained. He would... Think about how, what a marvelous thing it would be if we had his explanations of all the Old Testament questions to his disciples. Why didn't he? They didn't ask. They didn't even understand. When he said, he says, you know, they're going to kill me. Yeah. Gonna, I'm going to go there. But we, we've the got to stick with this lesson or we're going to yeah. we, we could We could discuss all night. But the, the, the disciples never says, oh, really? Well, what, do you, yeah. what do you mean? It just went right on past them. Maybe yeah. they, they did say that and it's not recorded. Uh, there again, that's possible. It's possible. You know, but probably not based on yeah. the other things that they said and did. Yeah. Well, we're doing some sanctified speculation, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> Okay, where every, we? every act of transgression, just below the middle there. Okay, every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. Okay, now who's doing the cutting? The person that does men choose and engage. Men separate themselves. Yep, okay. The law is an expression of God's idea. When we receive it in Christ, it becomes our idea. It lifts us above the power of natural desires and tendencies by temptations that lead to sin. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalms 119, verse 165. That cause is, them to stumble. Causes them to stumble. Uh, back, and that is, let's just quote, but some might want to look this up. This is really important in the context. This is Selected Messages written by Ellen White, book one, page 235. And if you want to read the whole context, start on page 233, okay? But go back up to the first part of this, uh, th this uh, uh, dark uh, text. The Law of Ten Commandments is a prescription. It is a description of the way intelligent creatures that have chosen to live in harmony with the Creator. And in fact, the way, the way if you have um, Young's literal translation is this, thou dost not do these bad things, rather than don't do the bad things. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a description. Yeah. Okay. After all the things that God had done for the children of Israel, He asked them to do just one thing obey and follow his guidance because it was the right thing to do. Indeed, it was for their best good. Why couldn't they figure that out? Could that whole set of, and the typical example I give repeatedly, you would think if you see every time they went to war following God's directions, they had outstanding victories, often, often without even losing a single soldier. But when they went to war, on their own plans without consulting God, they had disasters. Well, how many times does that need to happen before you realize, hmm, I think we probably ought to consult God before we take this on. Wow. Did you read that, uh, did we read that uh, selected messages? Yeah. That he was supposed to read? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, that's the one that Jim just read. Just, right. Because he went up. Right. Okay, could that whole set of ideas apply to us in our day? Do we obey the law because God's grace has saved us? Or do we obey the law in order to receive God's grace? Oh dear. If we could earn God's salvation, it would no longer be by grace. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is almost a lesson in grace and law. God does everything uh, for us, from creating us, to redeeming us, to protecting us and guiding us, etc. And he then turns and says, please, for your own good, obey my guiding principles in the law. Sorry, here. Many skeptics suggest that the God of the Old Testament was harsh, vindictive, even mean-spirited. By contrast, they think that Jesus was loving and kind. They failed to read and understand 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, which we'll look at in a moment. Luke 24, 44, and let me just read these two. Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking to his disciples after the resurrection, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the Law of Moses, that's the books of Moses, the writings of the prophets, all the prophetic books, and the Psalms, the rest of the Old Testament, had to come true. Okay, everything written about me. John 5, 39. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. Me, not Daniel, Moses. I mean, it, it speaks about them too, but the real point is, what does it say about God? These verses tell us clearly that God, that, I'm sorry, Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament. That's a shocker to many. So, so, we, what, really, what? so we really ought to read the Bible asking, what does it say to us about God? Yes, exactly. I thought we used to do that 20 years ago. We're, we're, uh, more we're still trying to do that. <laughs> That's why some translations do not have that text. Yeah. They do not, they, they omit the text, uh, John, 539. So what does God actually say in Deuteronomy that should guide us in, 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 in this direction? Carrie? Reading from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 15. Now, people of Israel, listen to what the Lord your God demands of you. Worship the Lord and do all that he commands. Love him, serve him with all your heart, and obey all his laws. I'm giving them to you today for your benefit. Mm -hmm. To the Lord belong even the highest heavens. The earth is his also and everything on it. But the Lord's love for your ancestors was so strong that he chose you instead of any other people. And you are still his chosen people. as from the Good News Bible. Many people find this idea hard to believe because they somehow believe that what they want to do is what is good for them. Oh, well, what I want to do, that must be good for me, right? That is not true. What God wants for them is what is good for them. That is so hard to get down in the minds of selfish people. It is interesting to note that God's directions in Deuteronomy are addressed to individual believers. Most of the commands are in the singular form in the Hebrew. But God recognized that while he was directing an entire nation, each person had to make up his or her own mind whether or not she or he was going to follow his will. So, do we really believe that all that God wants is what is best for us? Always? Sometimes the laws are compared to a hedge or a wall of protection. We read about that from the writings of Ellen White just a moment ago. As we noted earlier, God's law is simply a prescription for those who want to live the happiest, most successful, most fulfilling kinds of lives. If we had time, we could look all through the Old Testament and find many examples in which God mentions his delivering the people out of all the land of Egypt, and that was the reason why they should obey him. The same ideas are found in the New Testament. So here's another passage that not only talks about that, but suggests that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament. On the point of Egypt, I once went through and marked where, where it talks about Egypt every time, and it was 
in many of the many pages, it was several times on almost every page. Yeah. It's just numerous times. Yep. Getting back to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, also talking about Egypt. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Yes. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, the Hebrew word, and he was there in the Old Testament leading the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. So this from Paul is pretty explicitly saying that God that was on Mount Sinai and everywhere else mentioned in the Old Testament was Jesus well, Christ. And I already read those two verses yeah. where Jesus himself said the same thing. Yeah. But there's a problem in Deuteronomy 5. Look especially at verses 15 and verse 22. Remember verse 15 says that God brought them out of the land of Egypt. They should obey the Sabbath. They should keep the Sabbath because God brought them out of Egypt. And in, in Exodus it says, because God is our creator, right? Mm -hmm. But then in verse 22, we, we, and we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment, these verses read, read together and understood superficially seem to suggest that the Sabbath was given only for the benefit of the Jews. Many people want to make, take that point because they, they were the ones who were rescued from slavery in Egypt. We weren't rescued from slavery in Egypt. We know that the Sabbath was given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, long before there was any Jew. So let us restate the idea that we keep the Sabbath because God created us and he gave us those instructions back in the Garden of Eden. But he also emphasized the fact that he wants to save us by reminding us of what he did for the Jews by bringing them out of Egypt. This is an addition to, not a replacement of, his original command in the Garden of Eden. And what has been the attitude of many toward the Sabbath? Hebrews 4, 5, 1 to 5. Now God has offered us the promise that we may receive that rest that he spoke about. Let us take care then that none of you will be found to have failed to receive the promised rest. For we have heard the good news just as they did they heard the message, but it did them no good because they did, when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. We who believe then do receive the rest that God promised, which God promised. It is just as he said, I was angry and made a sol solemn promise. They will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. And what happened to them out there? All the adults died in the wilderness, except oh, Caleb and Joshua. Yep. He said this even though his work had been finished from the time he created the world. For somewhere in the scriptures, this is said about the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day from all his work. This same matter is spoken of again. They will never again, they will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. Thus, the Sabbath is not only a symbol of creation, but also a powerful symbol of redemption and grace. Notice that in the commandment to keep the Sabbath, everyone is commanded to rest, even the strangers within their gates. This is an amplification of the idea that the Sabbath is not just for Jews, but also for all with whom they were to come in contact. What God had, pre uh, uh, God had graciously done for them they needed to do for others. This principle was spelled out by Christ very clearly in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if my brother keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? Seven times? Let me interrupt right there. This was a principle that was believed among the Jews. They believed that you had to forgive someone six times. So Peter is trying to be generous. He's saying, seven times? <laughs> no, not seven times, answered Jesus, but 70 times seven. 
because the kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who decided to check on his servants accounts. He had just begun to do so when one of them was brought in who owed him millions of pounds. The servant did not even have enough to pay his debt, so the king ordered him to be sold as a slave with his wife and with his children and all that he had. In order to pay for the debt, the servant fell on his knees before the king. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you everything. The king for felt sorry for him, so he forgave him the debt and let him go. Then the man went out and met one of his fellow servants who owed him a few pounds. He grabbed him and started choking him. Pay back what you owe me, he said. His fellow servant fell down and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had him thrown into jail until he should pay all the mm. debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were very upset and went to the king and told him everything. So he called the servant in. You worthless slave, slave, he said, I forgive you a whole amount you owed me just because you asked me to. You should have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you. The king was very angry and he sent the servant to jail to be punished until he should pay back the whole amount. And Jesus concluded, that is how my Father in heaven will treat every one of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. From your heart. Yes. Wow. Now, which treatment is it going to be? The I forgive everything for you or I'm going to throw you in jail? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. But many strict Christians might respond by saying, but surely there is something we can do that makes us better in the eyes of God. How does that fit with this following statement from Ellen White? What is justification by faith? Now, that's a very important Christian teaching, isn't it? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When they begin to praise and exalt God all the day long, then by beholding they are becoming changed into the same image. What is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is his own real nature, that in himself he is worthless. Wow. That's pretty potent words, right? And there's a number of places where that's mentioned. Surely these words leave no room for human boasting or claiming that we can somehow earn our way to heaven. And there's references for that. 1 Corinthians 1, 31, Psalm 34, 3, and Jeremiah 9, 24. And what did I, maybe I'll just read Jeremiah 9, 24. That's an important one. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me because my love is constant and I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me. And what did our salvation cost? Looking at the life and especially the sufferings and death of Jesus should humble every one of us. We often focus on God's mighty acts, including sending the plagues, taking the children of Israel out of Egypt, carrying them through the Red Sea on dry land, speaking to them from Mount Sinai. And indeed, these were marvelous experiences. But imagine how much more wonderful it would be, it would have been, if they had allowed God to lead them all the way into the Promised Land, following His original instructions. And this, is, I think, is a huge mistake we read and we, we make in reading the books of, of Moses. We need to compare what God's original instructions were with what they fi finally ended up doing. Let me read those original instructions, Exodus 23, 20 through 33. Through Moses, God told the Israelites, quote, I will send an angel, that's a messenger, 
ahead of you to protect you as you travel and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. I have prepared. This is God speaking. Pay attention to him and obey him. Do not rebel against him, for I have sent him, and he will not pardon the rebellion. But if you obey him and do everything I command, I will, I will fight against all your enemies. My angel will go ahead of you and take you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Ebusites, and I will destroy them. Oh dear, is God killing people? Well, listen, keep reading. Do not bow down to their gods or worship them and do not adopt their religious practices. Destroy their gods, break down their sacred stone pillars. If you worship me, the Lord your God, I will bless you with food and water and take away all your illnesses. In your land, no woman will have a miscarriage or be without children. I will give you long lives. Really, what you've got going there is God wants to destroy their pagan understanding of God. It wasn't, well, it wasn't, he didn't want to kill, kill the people. Well, he wanted to get rid of their pagan religions. Okay. It goes on to say, I will make the people who oppose you afraid of me. I will bring confusion among the people against whom you fight. And I will make all your enemies turn and run from you. So now, how much, what, what kind of nations are left if all the people are running? Those nations, as nations, have disappeared, haven't they? They're gone. I will throw your enemies into a panic. I will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites as you advance. I will not drive them out within one year. If I did, the land would become deserted and the wild animals would be too many for you. Instead, I will drive them out little by little until there are enough of you to take possession of the land. I will make the borders of your land extend from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. And that actually happened under David and Solomon. I will give you power over the inhabitants of the land and you will drive them out as you advance. Do not make any agreement with them or with their gods. Do not let those people live in your country. If you do, they will make you sin against me. If you worship their gods, it will be a fatal trap for you. Good news, Bible. But they did it. And what did they do? That's exactly what they did. Yeah. And Moses certainly recognized God's original plan when he wrote Deuteronomy 9, 1 to 6. Jim? Listen, people of Israel. Today you are about to cross the river Jordan and occupy the land belonging to nations greater and more powerful than you. Their cities are large, with walls that reach the sky. The people themselves are tall and strong. They are giants, and you have heard it said that no one can stand against them. But now you will see for yourselves that the Lord your God will go ahead of you like a raging fire. He will defeat them as you advance, so that you will drive them out and destroy them quickly, as he promised. So and who's, dri who's driving them out? God. Okay. I have a question there. Yeah. So this is Moses talking, God talking through Moses in Deuteronomy to the people. Mm -hmm. Isn't this exactly what the 10 spies said? They're giants. They're yeah. tall and strong. It's true. God's not 40 years earlier. Yeah, 40 years earlier. And what happened? Because of the because they believed, because Israel believed that, they spent 40 years in wandering in the wilderness and, and they died. all died. And died. So so what's the difference? Well, human the, nature doesn't change a whole lot, does it? Well, the the well, the difference is God says if you let me do it, there won't be a problem. Yeah. And even when you go in using your plans, it won't be a problem so long as you're reasonably be cooperative. And that's what happened. Go ahead. After the Lord your God has driven them out for you, do not say to yourselves that he brought you in to possess the land because you deserved it. No, the Lord is going to drive these people out for you because they are wicked. It is not because you are good and do what is right that the Lord is letting you take their land. He will drive them out because they are wicked and because he intends to keep the promises that he made to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can be sure that the Lord is not giving you this fertile land because you deserve it. 
No, you are a stubborn people. Wow. His Bible. So you need to go back and read what Moses, the discussion between Moses and God back in Exodus. And what did that discussion say? Moses said, God, if you destroy all these people and make a great nation out of me, what will happen? The Egyptians the will say that you are not strong enough, God, to take your people into Canaan. So that passage needs to put with this one and says, okay, why is God taking them in? He has to do it to preserve his own honor. His own reputation. His own reputation. They did not want to let God take care of their enemies. They wanted to do it themselves with their own swords and with their own spears so that they would get the credit in the eyes of their enemies. And of course, and I don't know, we have time, I think. Let me just read Deuteronomy 20. This is what finally happened. Finally, God had to say to them, Deuteronomy 20, 16 and following, but when you capture cities in the land that the Lord your God is giving you, kill everyone. Completely destroy all the people, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord ordered you to do. Well, that wasn't God's original plan. Kill them so that they will not, why? So that they will not make you sin against the Lord by teaching you to do all the disgusting things that they do and the worship of their gods. When you're trying to capture a city, do not cut down the fruit trees and so forth. So why is God telling them they have to destroy all these people? So they won't be tempted to join. Fo follow their, follow their uh, evil uh, practices. What happened in Mount Sinai? Yeah. 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 So what not, you... It's not just what happened at Mount Sinai. It's what happened d just about every generation that we read about in Joshua and Judges and, yep. and on and on and on. Yes. So what should we learn from all this about our future? God has a plan. That plan was first established before time began. That plan was for all of us to be saved. How do we know that? Gary? I'm uh, reading from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He saved us and called us to be his own people, not because of what we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He gave us this grace by means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, now we have a problem. I hope you recognize. Many people read these passages and they say what? We are predestined. Yes. You can do whatever you like. If you're predestined to be saved, you'll be saved. If you're predestined to be lost, you'll be lost. What's wrong with that? Isn't that what it says right here? No element of choice, is there? No, nope. not in that theory. The difference is this. If you believe God can predict the future, we're back to that same challenge. God, can God look forward and see what's going to happen and then say this before the beginning of time? Or is God controlled by the same foibles that we have? And he says this, well, maybe, I hope. Go ahead. Reading from Titus chapter 1, verse 2, which is based on the hope for eternal life. God, who does not lie, promised us this life before the beginning of time. And that's from the Good News Bible. So there we have two verses clearly saying that God had a plan, a clear plan, before any human being was created. Yeah. Surely we recognize that if God set up the plan of salvation before the beginning of time, then nothing we could ever do or ever have done could in any way earn our salvation. Is that a fair conclusion? Yes. Seems like it, doesn't it? We cannot earn salvation. Moses made that very clear to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 9, verse 5. We just read that a moment again, but it's very important. Let's just repeat it again, Gordon. From the Good News Bible, it is not because, of your, not because you are good and do what is right that the Lord is letting you take their land. He will drive them out because they are wicked and have and because he intends to keep the promise that he made to your ancestors Abraham Isaac and Jacob now we're going to find if we put the whole old testament history together 
that each of these groups, these wicked people were given, remember from Abraham was told how many years? 400 more or less, 400 years. Okay, they got their 400 years. And then we see what happens here because they didn't change, they didn't improve. God gave the Jewish people 1,400 plus years. Actually, if you go back to Abraham, it's 1,800 plus years. Okay, God gave to them. And what happened at the end of that? that time was in captivity. A part of it, yeah. Part of it was. Yeah. And at the end of that, what did he have to do? He had to reject the, the Jews as a, I mean, the Jewish people as a people. Uh, they, they could be saved as individuals, but he had to be reject them as a people. And then he turned to Christians. And what happened to the Christian church? He won the know. Reformation. We got into all kinds of problems. We needed a Protestant Reformation. And what happened to the Pro Pro Protestant Reformation? Do we need to go on? <laughs> and what happened to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yeah, okay. We have seen all that God has done to make it possible for us to be saved. What more could he possibly have done without violating the principles of his loving government? Well, what could he have done if he didn't mind violating his principles? Could have forced. He could have forced us. We've already said God doesn't operate that way, right? He could have forced us. Okay, I'm not giving you a choice. You've all you, you're, you're robots. You got to do exactly what I say. That would have that would have accomplished the task, right? Yeah, but there's no love there. Okay. Oh. Myra. Okay. The enemy of Christ, who rebelled against God's law in heaven, has as a skilled, trained general, worked with all his power, bringing out one device after another, full of deception to make of none effect the law of God. The only true detector of sin, the stand of sin, the standard of righteousness. That's from uh, Ellen G. White, A Peculiar People, Review and Herald, November 18, 1890, paragraph 3. Two trillion galaxies burnish the cosmos. One hundred billion stars compromise each galaxy. Comprise that, each galaxy. Yeah, comprise. Uh, that's a big number. One hundred billion. A hundred billion, yes. One, two, yeah. two trillion galaxies of the hundred billion stars each come to... Please read that number for us. <laughs> Two zero 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 zero, and so forth. Yeah, stars. Now it's a principle of existence. Whatever conceives of and creates something must be greater than and transcend what is conceived of and created. Picasso is greater than and transcends an artwork by Picasso. The God who conceived of and created the, our cosmos must be greater than the cosmos and transcended as well. My goodness. With that in mind, think of the following text. Let's, I, let's, I have to think about what I just read. That, yeah. <laughs> Let Charles go ahead and read the next section. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. John 1, 1, 2, 3. And the word was? Jesus. Jesus Christ, yep. That is, the God who created all that was created, the 200, blah, 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 whatever many zeros, you didn't 24. tell me how, huh? 24 zeros. 24 zeros, okay. Stars and everything else, he did what? He shrank down, became a human baby, lived a sinless life, then died on the cross, bearing in himself the penalty for our sins and evil so that we can have the promise of eternal life. Wow, that's from our Bible study guide. So how would one describe true obedience in contrast to legalism? True obedience happens when followers appreciate what God has done and choose to follow his advice because they recognize its rightness and worth. Legalism suggests that someone is trying to earn salvation by keeping a set of rules or laws without really understanding why she or he is doing so. So, 
Is it true and can we verify it by experiences in our day that keeping God's law results in blessings and while disobeying God's laws, God's law leads to disaster? Can you think of any examples? I mean, we, we we're saying that through this lesson. Is it true? Of course it is true. Yeah. However, we need to remember that the day is coming when those who keep the Ten Commandments will be forbidden to buy or sell and orders will be given to kill them. Revelation 13, 15 to 18. They will suffer because they do keep the Ten Commandments. I think we have time to read those verses. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands and on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is, the beast's name with a number that stands for the name. Okay. Has the truth become clearer in your mind? Do you have a more accurate understanding of the relationship between grace and the law? In the mind of Moses, who lived through all these those experiences from the time of his return from the land of Midian until they were ready to enter the land of Canaan, it was clear that God had done just about everything he possibly could do for the children of Israel, and yet they were stiff-necked, rebellious, and had already begun to worship false gods. Mm. Mm. Is it unreasonable considering all that God has done for us to be willing to obey his laws even if we do not fully understand the reasons for every detail of that law? The first law that we know about in Scripture was God's law that was given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Even in that setting, notice that God first of all told them that they could eat of every tree of the garden freely except the tree of knowledge of what is good and what is evil. God gave them access to the entire garden, then he asked them, to obey. Do, do God's laws seem too burdensome to you? Does the yoke seem too heavy? Or does obeying God's suggestion for our lives come naturally in response to all that he has done for us? There's a true story told about a committed pastor whose wife fell gravely ill. He prayed repeatedly for her, and yet his wife never recovered. He became angry at God and decided to leave his ministry because God did not do the miracle he was asking for. Okay, how do you relate to God? Do you expect Him to do what you think is best? Or might you be willing to allow Him to work things out the way He knows is best? Are you motivated to keep His commandments? What motivates you to do that? Have you been convinced by our study today that keeping God's commandments is a worthwhile thing to do, a way to get God's blessing because it is the right thing to do? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a blessing it is to honor and glorify your name. We do believe that worshiping you and counting you as being the most blessed thing in our lives has all sorts of blessings, and of course there's the eternal life that is the final reward. May that reward soon be ours is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.